So yeah, my name is Maxi. You'll see a little bit later. My full names are Sarah Magdalene, which will be important later. Um, and yeah, the work that we do, Victory for All is a nonprofit um, organization in South Africa, and our focus is we, um, we desire to break the cycle of poverty through loving care and high quality education. And so that means that in South Africa, private education is really great, but really expensive. And most people in our country don't have access to that. And so all the government schools and all the public schools are not great. They're classrooms of 50 to so kids in a class, teachers don't show up, violence, very not great. Um, and so we're like, how are we going to give an opportunity for this generation to break the cycle of poverty that they were born into um, if we're not giving them access to the kind of development and education that they need? So our work, we have a private um, early childhood development center. We serve children from six months old to five years old, making sure they're developmentally on track for school and education. And then we have a private school. Um, the parents pay about 10 bucks a month, $10. Um, if you were to go to a normal private school in South Africa, you would pay about $500 a month. So um, the parents of our community um, pay, and, and our school is located in the under-resourced community um, of ours, so the kids get to walk from home to school. And then we have a, a kindergarten through eight, ninth grade now. We're starting our 10th grade next year, which we're very excited about. Then we also have a whole village for special needs education. Um, this is the only one that's accessible in our whole um, district or our ho whole region um, that actually provides special needs care for children in that area of low income um, or no income families. And then we have foster care. We run six foster, we have six foster homes with six foster moms that are awesome, that take care of about five to six kids that have been placed in their care by court order. Um, due to various reasons why they've been removed. So that's the gist of like my context. And so, um, so we serve about 650 to 700 children every day um, in the programs that we do, and we subsidize all the funding. Um, we get no government support or government grants. We fundraise for all of it. So <laughs> it's, that's why I'm the resource developer. Is I get to fundraise and ask people for money for our awesome kids to make sure that we get to provide these services and we get to employ quality teachers. And we have about 90 staff members and they're also all locally, local staff members from the local community and they serve our schools. So that's, that's Victory for All in a nutshell and that's kind of what my day to day is, is I resource our principals and our schools with um, support on all levels, whether it's fighting for them for a zoning issue or a municipal issue or a money issue or a book issue. Um, my job is to make sure they have what they need to do the vital work of serving the children. So, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very privileged to be here and I feel very grateful to share with you this morning and also very humble to share with you a bit of the South African um, story and my story and uh, through the lens of scripture. So I just want us to take a moment to just pray and settle in um, because, I, yeah, I think when we were singing Make Room, I actually was singing that song in my head this morning. I was listening to it in where we were staying in preparation for today. So God's definitely, you know, onto something. So, um, yeah, let's just um, close our eyes and pray as we enter into this time. Jesus, I am so grateful that you are our friend and that you are with us. And God, I pray that as we enter into this time that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what you would have for us. And that we would hear and be challenged, that we would not be fearful for what you're saying, but that we realize that what you're saying is breaking down fear in love and giving life. So may these words be life-giving, and may, may it be freeing as we enter into this time. I pray this in your name. Amen. 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 So I actually have no idea how much time I have, by the way. Okay, so I told them this can either be 15 minutes or an hour and a half. I have no idea how this is gonna, how this is gonna go. So, um, Today we're going we're gonna to dive into the story of the Good Samaritan, 
all of us know, have we roughly read the story? Okay, it's gonna be fun. But um, I do wanna be mindful of the fact that I am South African born. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So I'm gonna be using terms that are very normal in my context and I just wanna make sure that you, um, you hear them because one of the terms could be offensive here. So I just want to highlight that. So in South Africa, there is an ethnic group called the colored people that, that are there. So they're, that's their ethnic identity and people in South Africa are known by being colored. So if I say that, just understand that that's what I'm talking, that's the reference that I'm, um, in Afrikaans we say clearling. So that's the reference for, and, and they identify as colored and that's their ethnic identity. Um, and it's not black Africans, it's, it's a mix, mixed people. Um, that came way back because the Khoisan and the Malaysian, there were slaves from the Malaysian, so it's a mix, it's really a mix, it's not, it's not even how mixed race might even look here. So just to give that context. And then um, when I talk about under-resourced communities, I, um, I talk about um, what in South Africa was also known as, they called it the location or townships. And townships were normally places where they would, um, especially during apartheid, they would forcefully remove people out of, out of houses and had used um, sink roofing, I think sink is a good word, or aluminum roofing, I don't know, and they build like housing. And so in, 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 in the African context, that was normally used for animals, right? That was normally on the farms or they'll use that to store the animals. So when the apartheid government was doing that, they would like build these whole settlements of people, move them out, move the indigenous people, the African people out of the cities and into these designated, demarcated areas that would be predominantly shacks that people would live in with the clear idea that we're communicating something very clearly, which is what the government was doing. They were communicating very clearly that you are not human enough for the city. So just when I talk about townships, I, I want to challenge you to think of some of the, the, the people who are experiencing homelessness and the little you know, groupings of tents and different things or cardboard that they make homes out of. So just imagine that on one of these big stretches of desert that you have and just like thousands of them in one place. So just that's, that's a township roughly. So just to give you a picture of what we're, if I refer to some of the places back home. So um, we're going to be talking about Luke 10, and I just want to give you the context of the scripture. So I find it very interesting that at the beginning of Luke 10, Jesus starts off by, by saying, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, go two by two and serve, right? Go into the homes, and so that's where, that's where the, the chapter starts. Then it goes into talking about, like, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear. And, and then it goes into our story that we're going to be engaging today. And then after that, so it goes from an instruction to do to, into Mary and Magdalene, where Jesus says, Mary, you have chosen the right place. Sit and be. So I'm like, okay, God, you just told them to go. But now you're also telling Mary, like, don't be so, like Magdalene, don't be so busy, but sit and be. Like, wait, what? Like, how, how are we going to be doing these things? And then in the middle is this story of the Good Samaritan. Which, by the way, it doesn't ever say in the Bible, Good Samaritan. That was just a title that was added. Because if you were, if you were in those times, you would have never associated good with Samaritan. Like, the Samaritans were like a result of war 700 years, and the, the, the Israelites and the Samaritans were not friends. They literally hated each other, and they were not, and like the Samaritans were known as unclean. And, and so that's where we, um, where we find ourselves in this like story. So let's read together. So we're going to start in Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put, put him, that's Jesus, to the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Well, what is written in the law? How, does, how do you read it? 
Um, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, yeah, you have answered correctly. Now go and do this and you will live. Like this is how you will have life. But wanting to justify himself, that's what lawyers like to do, right? He wasn't really like a lawyer, lawyer, but anyway. <laughs> um, he said to him, well, who is my neighbor? You know, like Jesus, you gotta be specific here. You can't just have like blanket statements like that. So that's when Jesus goes into the story. So he says, Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he encountered robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. So just, again, context. So this road was known to be especially dangerous. It was called the road of blood. Because there, and so I was actually talking to Chris because I was like, I wouldn't have stopped because literally in, in South Africa, we have like a lot of like hijackings and what they actually do back home is they will fake injuries to get people to stop. To, so I'm like, of course I'm not gonna like stop, like it's not safe. But then I'm like, it wouldn't have been safe to stop there as well. Do you know, like it wouldn't have been safe for anyone to stop because this man had been, so I, I've personally been wrestling with that as I've been even thinking about that. Mm, okay, what would I have done in my context? But anyway, and by coincidence, a priest was going down th that road and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. How many times have we done that? <laughs> Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, felt compassion. And came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put, on his own, put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, his own money, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed compassion to him. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. I love how Jesus doesn't say much, but says like <laughs> a ton. So this, this will invoke, I'm going to pose two things. This will invoke two th feelings for us. You will either ask, like I did, what, it, what will happen to me if I stop, right? Or you could possibly ask, what will happen to them if I don't stop? So, so those are... And you will also probably have one of two experiences. You'll either, either have the experience that I have, which is like, ooh, how many times have I walked past and didn't stop? Or walked to the other side? Or you will have the experience of like, how many times have someone walked past and not helped? And however you react to either of those questions will tell you where you fall on the spectrum of society today. Which is why we called it the litmus t test of humanity. Because there are a very large grouping of people who go, I am desperate, can someone just stop and help me? I'm like broken and bandaged. And like how many people are just gonna walk past me and just miss me? Or you're gonna be like me who go, I have all the privilege and the, like, the, I can just walk on the other side and still get to where I'm supposed to be to go worship in the temple. And so, for me, this, this gets very close to home because once we realize where we fit in the story, we can adequately respond to what we need to do, right? Because if you're the one broken God isn't going to ask you to, like, deal with your sins first. He's just going to go, like, I love you. I'm going to take care of you. Right? God hears the cry of the oppressed. God hears the cries of the brokenhearted. But if you're like me, I need to be challenged every day to go, like, oh, 
I, what am I going to do in this situation, right? And so, but I have to understand where I fit. So I am a, I'm a white South African. So when I was born in 1983, giving away my year, my age, <laughs> I was born in 1983 into apartheid South Africa. That would mean that apartheid was still very much happening. It was still very much the rule of the law. Apartheid only fell formally in 1994. And it started actually way back when in 1990, uh, ni ni 1955. I don't know. My English has been really wonky. Just so you know, English is actually my second language. So um, I want to share with you um, my dad, who is a, is, he's an accountant. He's awesome. He keeps all of our stuff, which I appreciate deeply. So when I was moving on and growing up, he's like, oh, here's all your like important documents, like your birth certificate. And, and he hands me this other document. I'm like, well, what is this? And he's like, oh, yeah, that was your race classification card. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. So um, Sharon, you can put that up. So he, um, he gave me this card. And I was like, so that's why I'm, it's ASM van der Merwe. My last name's van der Merwe before I got married. Um, and so as you can see, it says, my, my last name and my, sir, my first names and my identity number, and then, so has been classified as a Blanca. Which means I was classified in a category when I was born. So I didn't choose to be white, but I also didn't choose to be classified. Just on a side note. But, but so that's what I was born into, right? But with that, it also bore me into a system that I greatly benefited from, but it also greatly isolated me. Because what, what it does and what apartheid did is it separated people, right? It created systemic systems of separation. And so everywhere in society, and I see it in, in America and I see it on multiple places, Structures are of separation because we fear. We fear the other. We fear two things. We fear the other and we fear that there's not enough. So if, if we fear someone else because we fear if they have something, I'm not going to have enough. So then I have to make sure that they are getting less so that I can, And then it becomes an us and them thing. Right? Isn't a friend of mine recently um, said it's so like it feels like everything always just boils down to a us and them conversation. It so quickly goes politically in Christianity, and it's like instantly like you start without. I I did it. I was talking to him. And it's like see like you're doing the us is them thing, and I'm like oh like it happens so like we are so conditioned to think that way. So being born into the system. Like, so in 1950, they classified, by, by 1955, they had classified like 11 million people in South Africa. And then um, if you were not white, you would have to carry like a pass. There was curfews, you were not allowed to be in certain places, you were forcefully removed, you weren't able to buy land. It's like a whole, it's, that's a different conversation. <laughs> Happy to have that um, with anyone. But what I've had to learn in this process is that my ethnic identity as an Afrikaans person has nothing to do with the system of whiteness, but I need to work really hard to dismantle the system of whiteness. Okay, so I wanna, that, that would be my challenge to you, is to understand that your color of your skin does not, does not um, determine whether we have to dismantle systems of oppression. And, and whiteness is a system of oppression in, the ter in, in my terms, right? The system of, of apartheid South Africa. And so the reason I wanted to share this with you is because the story of, of the Good Samaritan really enters into that narrative of separation, right? Because that's what was going on. Because the Israelite didn't want to have anything to do with those guys. Samaritans are not. And then I found it interesting that, like, why did, 
like, why did Jesus make the Samaritan the lead character here? Have you thought about that? Because wouldn't it have it been more apt that the priest stop and care and be compassionate? Like, wouldn't it, like, to the people who are like, yes, we are the good people, right? <laughs> we'll stop. <laughs> and yet, here Jesus goes and says, no, listen, your enemy stopped. You, you did. <laughs> the enemy stopped for the... The enemy felt compassion. And as Jesus is going along, he's like, we have gotten so used to a system of of separation and us versus them, good, evil, like they're the bad people, my enemy, like that we've missed our connectedness. So if we reframe this question, it started with him asking, what do I do to inherit life? And isn't what Jesus says through all scriptures, I came to give you life and life in abundance. It's making a choice for life now, not just one day when we're in heaven. And like it's about life now and eternal life today. And how do we get life? By, By loving our neighbor by loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to, where I'm going to, um, so I was, we were, Chris and I were in Chicago right before we came here. And as we're, it's raining, it is cold. I'm from South Africa, it's Africa, it's hot, like I was freezing. It's cold, it's raining, and we're walking, and we're walking, and I, I tell Chris, I'm like, what is that? So you can put up the two pictures. Um, so this was one of them. And if you can just notice the, the hole in her hand. But you can do the next one. And then I saw this one, but only from the angle. And the first thought that popped into my head was like, oh my gosh, like, how could, like is that really a person sleeping there? And like, how am I going to get him out of the rain? I don't know the city, I don't know like what, and, and Chris is gonna probably be annoyed that I'm gonna wanna like do something for this guy and he's sleeping, and then we walked around, and then we saw, oh, oh. I was like, thank goodness. I'm like, <laughs> but like, it was, but that was the point of the statue, of, of the thing, right? And if you look in his feet, if you could zoom in, you could see the nails in his feet. And it's a depiction of Jesus as homeless. And it, um, it was in front of the Catholic mission, interestingly enough. And so as I saw that, I was like, oh, this is like, this is, Je- like, how do you see Jesus? And where do you see Jesus? Because if we see that our enemy, or those on the margins, or those who are not like us, if we realize that Jesus is in them, and he, like, they're the, in the image of God. How can I not stop? Because I should be stopping for Jesus, right? <laughs> like, that would be problematic if I didn't stop for Jesus. <laughs> but, like, how many times do we miss Jesus because we're not willing to stop? And if our society becomes so overwhelmed, And that's how it is for me back home a lot, and I've had to learn a lot about this. If our society becomes so overwhelming that if you think, well, if I stop for this one, what about that one? And if I stop for this one, like, I'm not going to have enough. I'm not going to, like, how can I, like, and you get so overwhelmed, then society will be stopped by those who we have not stopped for. And and also... (laughs) Like, we will just miss the boat. (laughs) We will just completely, like, miss the kingdom of God. And so for us to have life, like, we need to engage in these kinds of practices. And so um, I actually took this next image a few days later in, in Portland. And I, we were driving, and I, I saw it, and I was like, oh. 
And I've seen it in, in America in the, in the little bit, in the two weeks we've been here. Like I've seen these images and I'm constantly wondering like, what is the American church going to do about this? Or should we send some missionaries from Africa to come and help out? We've learned a lot from missionaries coming to us. So, so like, should we be sending people to America <laughs> to come and tell them about Jesus? <laughs> because I literally have not seen this as much as I, I've come to America since I was 18. This is the first time where it's been literally everywhere I've gone. Like, I've seen it. And I'm just like, do they not see it? Like, that's, and I'm honestly asking, like, do people not... And it's a complicated issue. I'm not, please, our issues are extremely complicated, and I would never want someone to come in and go, oh, here's the five-step plan to fix issues in South Africa. This is what you do. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is to how are we as the church paying attention to what is happening in our context, and how are we stopping for those in need and responding to the one person that I see? Not to the whole crisis, but to the one. And, having be, and being open to see that. Because we could also choose just to go on the other side of the road. And act like we have our visors on. And to come back to my point of separation. Sin is separation from God, right? So, sometimes, and sin is death. But Jesus comes to give life. And sometimes we get so sidetracked and we get so lured by systems of death that, that pose as systems of life. So when we were singing, break down the walls of my religion, or shake my traditions, religion and those things tend to blind us to think that, oh, I can't do that because I'm going to get dirty. It's going gonna, it's gonna to somehow desanctify me if I engage in these things. So the virtuous thing is to not. I'm on my way to the temple. I'm on my way to church. Can't get interrupted. The best thing I love about, we call it African time, the best thing I love about South Africa is you can be late for anything. <laughs> Literally. You just go, oh, African time, you know. Mm. It's literally, why? Because... In South Africa and in an African context, relationships and who's in front of you is more important in, in who's coming next. So if I'm having a really good chat with you, I'm not going to pass you by. I'm going to stop and say, oh, hey, how are you doing? And we're going to go into a whole conversation. And yes, my dad would go, no, what? you're disrespecting the person you're going to, which I agree. But at the same time, there's a beauty in that to, to engage with who, who is in front of you and in the present. And so, why do we keep choosing death when life is the option? It's because we think the systems of death are life. And unfortunately, money, greed, consumerism, all the great, you know, makes life comfortable and makes life easy. All those things lure us away from what is actual life. We think if, we're, if we have just a little bit more money or if we have just a little, like, we'll be more comfortable, and then we'll have life. That's not life. God is life. Jesus is life. Living in his ways is life. Breathing in his words is life. Being free from fear because of love is life. Casting out fear is receiving life. And so our invitation is to, is, to, is to find life by actually seeing the systems of death that we think are life and identifying them. So as a South African and as what, we're, what we need to engage in back home, my daily challenge is to understand that I need to be freed from being white to be a follower of Jesus, not, remember what I said, not my skin, but from a system that is built 
on oppressing other people. And you know what? South Africa, is, it's 30 years down the line. The system hasn't changed. The people running the system has changed. Do you know what it's produced? So much corruption that we don't have power or electricity for almost nine to 10 hours a day. Because the system hasn't changed. There are African men and leaders who are in leadership. It didn't change, it's the system that's the problem. And if we do not actively engage in breaking and building a new system, we'll, we'll see the same results. We'll still continually see people who can't afford houses, people who can't afford food. Because we're gonna be walking in that same system. And so, um, so I think my invitation to you as a church is to ask, how will you start tending to the suffering? How will you start stopping <laughs> and tending to the suffering? And it, it's not always just the extreme things like homelessness. I'm talking about gender-based violence, abuse, neglect, all those things. How are we, how are we gonna stop and tend to the brokenness we see in our own space? Because if we are able to start to stop and listen, we'll hear and see the brokenness. But if we're going to keep living isolated, here's the thing. When I was growing up, I was 10 years old when apartheid fell. There was almost a civil war in the late 90s in South Africa. Do you know what? I had no idea. No idea. I was living my happy life. I was going to school, going to my athletics, going and doing my stuff. I had no idea what was going on because we lived in a bubble that was designed that way. So I wouldn't even have known. It's happening today in places like Russia and Ukraine where people don't, the, the rest of, and that's the thing, the rest of the world saw what was going on in South Africa. I had no idea because it was built that way. So if we're not willing to step out of what was the, the things that are built to separate us, we won't realize that we are all connected. And in, in South Africa, there's a beautiful concept called Ubuntu. And it's, it says, I am because you are. My humanity is intrinsically connected to your humanity. It's almost like a lily pad. You see it on the river and they look like all different plants, but under the water, they're all connected. And if you cut one off, you're cutting off the plant. We are all connected. You here in this community, you with us back in South Africa, and so we need to engage in these things, both here and globally, for a movement of God, for life to come in places. So that's my invitation to you, is to know that you are now intrinsically connected to the South African people. It is both a place of healing, a place of redemption, a place of hope, and a place of challenge. And so I, formally invite you guys to come to South Africa, <laughs> to come and visit and come and see and come and learn and come and share and come and serve because we are connected. And as much as I need to learn from you, you need to come learn from us because there is something of God in the African people that you will never see until you're on our ground and you, and you engage with us. There's something of you that we won't know until we engage because we are together and we are one and we are all representatives of God 
in the kingdom. And so there is so much to this that I could spend hours talking about this. And I had a poem, but I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it. <laughs> See, I told you I'm like not, not great to keeping to my notes. Um, but I really want to invite you to just help be willing to go on the journey. I'm 40, and I feel like I'm only scratching the surface of, like, really engaging in this conversation. Because I also want to just honor both the people of South Africa that was there before me and honor the people that was here before you and before this city. Because there's histories and stories of people that we don't know because systems of death has killed them. And we, we need to be reminded that God is in all things and all places. Our invitation is to see him. And not to make people like us, but to see God in them. And to see God lying there, Jesus lying there, having been beaten. Because that's how we're going to find life going to cost us something to engage and it will challenge you I remember going through a, a course with some fellow South Africans who were white, uh, white and black and um, colored and we would have these, these same experiences we would go to the slave lodge and the castle in, in Cape Town and like we would have these same physical experiences and pilgrimages and I could see the experience they were having was deeply healing and for me, deeply challenging. Because if I was born back then, I would have not been the one in the dark room with the 40 other people in a one by one meter thing. I would be up drinking my tea and crumpets in, in my global and going, ooh, this is nice, God is good, look at what the Lord has provided for us. You know what I mean? So I need to be aware of where I fit in the story and the history to understand how God can challenge my heart for what is true faith and true life. Because so easily death looks like life for people. And we need to find life, guys, all of us. And so may you be, may you be encouraged and challenged, <laughs> but may you also just be willing to go on the journey of engaging in the conversation. It might lead you just down the street to go on a walk and just start paying attention to what's going on around you and seeing what you see, and asking God, God, will you open my eyes for what's going on? And then will you give me creative solutions on how we can solve this, or make it better, or just, you know what's the biggest thing? Just even acknowledging people, and acknowledging their humanity. You know what's the biggest gift you can give to a person who is begging or homeless? Acknowledging their existence. It doesn't cost you anything to just stop and say hi. And even just to listen how much their life sucks. Like, even that act is an act of resistance because you're acknowledging their humanity and you're acknowledging God in them. That's not the end. That's not where it should end. But that's, a, like, that's at least, that's, that's the least we can do. <laughs> And so my challenge would be, like, how are we going to pay attention to the people? And how are we going to pay attention to what the Spirit is saying in us if we're not opening our eyes and our ears when we walk? I love that Jesus walked everywhere, by the way. Because it's when he was walking, he was finding everything and seeing everything and having all these things. Jesus keeps walking next to people and surprising them and doing these things as they're walking. You know, like, we need to walk more, less cars. Um, 
So, so that's my invitation. Go take a walk. I took Tim and them into the museum yesterday. Tim and Sharon, first time. I was like, yeah. But it was so interesting. I learned so much. But I'm like, have you ever been into the museum? I mean, you know, <laughs> like, just, it might be something. There might be some one thing you learn from that, from having gone there, you know? So that's the invitation. It doesn't have to be complicated. But the invitation is also to, like, go on a global mission strip and come listen and learn and see how things are done outside because it'll help inform how you see things here. So just get out of the, like, the bubble of separation. Find life in oneness. And oneness with the other churches and oneness with ministries and oneness with, with the people that don't believe in God. And just, just don't look through the boxes of separation because then we're going to get systems like apartheid and things like that that classify people. Do you know what was the second law that, that passed after the, the Populations Act? The Prohib Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act. Because it gets complicated. If we can't like keep like all these people marrying the same people because we can keep that classification clean, right? But if we start letting people like mix, then it like that's a problem because now I don't have categories for all these different peoples, right? Systems of death are very strategic, guys. Like, they are very intentional. Notice wherever you travel, bridges and railways will separate. Roads will separate communities. Your major roads, railways, and transportations will be the thing that separates neighborhoods. And you will have a clear, oh, that neighborhood is that side. That. You, can, you see this so is, that South Africa is designed that way. So what I love about what we do is we built the school in the neighborhood that everyone's like, why are you building a school there? Like, what, what? Like, why don't you take the kids from there to the, and we're like, no, this is their, the, like, now I have to organize, like, they can walk. And you know how our, our school looks like a castle? What I love about it, it looks like a castle. Because we, we want to instill value in our kids to tell them you are, king, like, you're the king's kids. You're, it's called King's College. So they're like, you are princes and princesses of God. So every time they walk in there, they, they literally have the most beautiful school building in the entire town. And literally next to us is like sewage or like, you know, like it's, an, it's the roads are dodgy outside. Like we can't, like literally, but we're, we're making it, we're literally making, bringing life in areas where death wants to, to rule. And so that's what we need to start doing. We need to disrupt the systems that keep wanting to build places of separation. Not holy places of consecration and separation before God. That's not what I'm saying. But when Jesus died, what happened in the temple? The mantle tore, right? It tore the place of thing that would separate us from God. So, like, why do we keep thinking separation and separateness is the way that, like, life needs to be? So, that is my challenge. <laughs> and my challenge to myself. Guys, I'm standing here, someone who constantly has to get, engage in this. Back home, you could so easily become so used to suffering that you don't even notice it. And I constantly have to be literally driving to my work every morning going, like, this is not normal. People living, like, without water and pit toilets and not enough food and in shock. Like, this is not normal. This is not how it should be. This is not what God has. Like, I have to tell myself that. Because otherwise I could just get so used to it that it's like, oh, that, well, that's just normal. Like, that's just how it is. It, it teaches you complacency. So you have to be so intentional because the systems of this world are designed to keep us complacent and separate. And so that is the invitation, is to be awake and alive and engaged. And it's going to cost you, and it's tiring. It's going to cost you your two denarii to go, okay, I'm going to pay for you to go stay in the hotel tonight. 
Oh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pay for you to go see the doctor and hopefully they can give you some help, you know? So that's my prayer and that's my invitation. And I would love to have more conversations about this with you um, as a church or as an individual. If you wanna know more, please, you are welcome to come and talk about anything. So Tim, I'm at the end of my, I, I have a benediction that I would like to read for you at the end, but pray or pray over you. <laughs> what, what just I'm happened? struggling today, guys. <laughs> I'm kind of don't Tim's having just, a great day. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. It's probably good that I didn't preach today. Yeah, I clearly. All over the place. Goodness. Okay. Um, I, I have some questions for you. Okay, but go before, for it. Before we get into some questions, yeah. just to kind of finish, and then yeah, I yeah. want to ask you to pray that blessing over us now um, in just a moment. Yeah. But before we do that, can, can we say thank you to, <laughs> to Maxie? Maxie, here's what I love about you is you did this in our living room when we first met. You did this this weekend when we were hanging out and you just did it today is um, and I knew that this was is exactly what was going to happen. But by the way, let me let, let you in on a little secret. Maxie hasn't preached in a local church in like eight years. Yeah. And so she was very nervous about like, well, how's it going to go? And is it going to be good and clear and all of that? Didn't she do a great job? Um, but I knew, I knew that you weren't gonna do like, here are my three points, they all start with the same letter. I, and I'm thankful for that because the conversation that you just invited us into can't really be broken down to an alliterative three points or an easy acronym. And I love that you said, I can't just give you five steps to fix South Africa. And so I can't do the same for your city either. I loved that. Um, I, I, so I, I, I just was sitting here watching you kind of build a, a culture for us and showing us what that looks like to live the way that you live and the way that Jesus would invite us to live and then just say, come and, come and talk, come and learn. Um, and so I know that one of the things that you and I have discussed is um, the idea that this message today would, would be the beginning of something yeah. for our church. Um, and so I've got a couple of ideas of some questions that I want to ask you, but I, but I also just want you to know that what we're dreaming up together is continuing this conversation between Lancaster and South Africa, certainly over Zoom, thank God for technology that we can engage with. Um, and I'll talk to you more about that in a second. Um, but, but I think also in person as you, please come back, um, but also we hear your invitation loud and clear, and, yeah. and we are dreaming together. In fact, my daughter, Sayla, texted me today when I said, turn and tell someone yeah. what you are, uh, what are you making room for God to do? Te Sayla texted me and said, mine was to go on a missions trip. I think God is telling our church to go out and spread the gospel and help people. It was before, before your yeah. sermon. Yeah. So, go uh, so that's, an, that's a seventh grade person. Uh, so the gauntlet has been laid, Life Church. Um, but, I, but I have a couple of questions, and, yeah. and I think that there's some more questions that we can have in the future. But um, if you could say that there, knowing that there aren't like five steps, mm. um, what is one practical thing that we can do that while we're praying the prayer, God, help me to see the humanity yeah, yeah. and the people yeah. around me that have needs. What's one practical thing that we can do as individuals that would position us really well to, yeah. to respond to needs when we yeah. see them? Um, I think the first thing to do is to immerse yourself in your context, but not the context you're used to, the context that like you walk the opposite side of. Huh. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like to immerse yourself. So get to know someone who is outside of your frame of, so it, it's, it's immersing and listening, mm. both to what you're seeing and hearing, but also to God as that is happening. Yeah. And as you immerse, you need to allow God to let that, ref, like have time reflecting what is that exposing in yourself or in your society. 
And once you've done that, <laughs> you can enter into a place where you can go, like, God, like, give me some prophetic imagination for, like, how we address this here together. And again, my invitation is to do it with someone. Yeah. But someone who is probably not like you. <laughs> if you're a man, get a few women around you. <laughs> If you're white, get some people who are not white. If you're not white, get some other people, you know? Like, just engage in the conversation in the context of others. Yeah. It's very helpful because everyone sees differently. And so together you will see. Um, so I think immersion and reflection of that is very important for to set yourself up to actually actively engage in the solution. I love it. So, because there isn't a pen, like, listen, everyone wants to have, they're like, how can we duplicate this, right? They want to have a thing that you can duplicate and multiply. It's the same in South Africa. Like, how can we find one solution that works here, but all across? And it's like, there isn't such a thing. Because the answer in Lancaster looks different than the answer in Los Angeles. Right. Looks different than the answer in Texas looks different than the answer in Jeffreys Bay, South Africa, versus Cape Town, South Africa, versus Pretoria, South Africa, because it's you, the community, that responds. So that's, the, that's what I would so suggest. Good. Now, one other question that I, I don't know if this is going to be circling around the mm -hmm. whole room, but I know it's something that pops up in my mind, is when you use language like working to dismantle or, yeah. or reconstruct systems, mm -hmm. Um, the word politics pops up <laughs> for us a lot. Now, um, in America, yeah. politics has been a divisive, yeah. destructive, mm -hmm. uh, and I think in a lot of ways used by the devil yeah. to tear the church apart. Yeah. Uh, and we've done a lot of work to be very, and you know some of this, but like we've, in, in the American church, we have to do work to not pursue unhealthy levels of power. Yeah. So how do we engage work against un godly systems without becoming the bad guy? So the invitation there would be, and this is just, it's like just build something new. Build something new. So if you have a problem with the system, like unless you're in this that system, like unless you're active, like if you think this is the, the like and you're in that system and you have, have the authority or the, like you could do something in there, the invitation actually is to like, how are we creating? So for us, for example, the easy option would be to like build our school where it's safer. We don't have that many break-ins. We would do it that side of town. We would just bus people to where we are. That would be the easy option for us, right? But the better option is to like face the challenges, but like disrupt the fact that access to education isn't for people in the poor communities. So what are we doing? We are just going there and going, okay, you don't have access to education, so we will give you access to quality education. So we're building something new. But, but that's not easy, and people are going to push back against that, and like the, everyone's going to have an opinion. But it's sometimes the invitation is just to go, maybe God is asking us to, not, to build a new system of kingdom that is never going to fit in the system that is operating, and will and just know... People who have power love separation because it's easier to control people and, and so it threatens them. So, so separation threatens power. I mean, like, oneness threatens power. So we need to actively work against like separation. So whatever you can do to be inclusive and open will automatically push back on, on polarization because that is unfortunately where the American church and I mean the American political, it's like you're either this or that. There's no room for nuance, right? There's no room for you to be two things at the same time. <laughs> like, and I think that's the biggest thing is if we can hold that, like that two things can be true. I, I think that's actually a really great place to end mm. that thought. Um, and I would, just, I would just add as your pastor <laughs> how important it is for us to hold the tension, right? So for example, we probably know someone who's engaged in politics. We, 
what you didn't just hear Maxie say is they're evil. Um, I think what you heard was uh, build something new. And also, I would add, pray for the people who are in the system, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and that's that, yeah. can you hold two things in yeah, tension? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't need to gain power that I'm not supposed to have. I'm supposed to pray for those who have power that they would lead like God would lead if mm. he were them, right? And so when it comes down to like, who are the politicians in your life? Who are the people in law enforcement in your life? Who are the teachers in your life? Who are the people in the system that you know? Pray for them mm. and then build what God calls you to build. Right. And then how do we cross the bridge and do part? And how do you invite them into yes. the new system? Right. Right. Because if they're experiencing something different that you're creating, they're like, oh, maybe this is a better way so good. to do it. You know, so invite them in <laughs> to experience what the new thing you are building. That's so good. <laughs> So I, I, I wanted to make sure that we sort of turn this into mm. a bit of a conversation towards the end here because I, I want you to get a taste of something that we are hoping that we build. Um, we know that the future of the church will be healthy and whole and sent well. Um, certainly while we come and sit at the feet of Jesus, but while we remember that he also sent out the 72. Yeah. I love that you, yeah. you mark that this story of the Good Samaritan is bookended by yeah. sending the 72 and Mary being, Mary being praised sitting for sitting at, yeah. at the feet of Jesus. We have to do both of those things. And, and the way that we will figure out how to do that in the future of who God is making us as a church is if we talk about these things. Mm -hmm. These are going to be some challenging and difficult conversations, and we want to invite you to bring all of your questions and thoughts and ideas. And so we haven't set a date for this yet, but we already are uh, planning very shortly, like within, we, we were saying like within about a month yeah. or, or something like that, that we want to actually have a follow-up conversation that we'll do online because mm -hmm. Maxie is going to go home to South Africa. Um, and we're just going to invite her to join us on a digital conversation. And so if there's something here that you go, I have more questions, or, or I'm curious about this, or how do, I, how do I go and visit? How do I go and learn? Or how do we get you guys to come back over here? Or, or how do we partner and get sent out into our community? If, if this is at all a conversation that is interesting to you, for you to continue, there is a sign-up sheet on the info uh, table in the back. As you walk out, we just would love for you to put your name, email address, phone number down on that piece of paper. And then we're going to set a date within the next four weeks, and uh, we're just, and then we'll email you out a Zoom link for you to jump onto a call, and uh, we're going to do multiple of these. Uh, we're even talking about maybe reading some books together and having some discussions together here in the church, and Maxie is going to essentially help uh, be kind of like a spark, a catalyst for us to have some needed conversations here mm -hmm. so that we can go out there and around the world uh, in the name of Jesus and yeah. do that well. Because uh, it is, frankly, not enough for us to just come and sit here at the feet of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have to also be sent. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen? Now, I'm going to ask you to pray for us. But before you do that, I was yeah. sent a message that we do actually have the video ready. Oh, And I think okay. that this is really important because yeah. I, if you're inviting us to South yes. Africa to visit you and you see the work that you're doing, them. then we want to see you what that work is. So, uh, They're in, way cuter in, than indulge I Indulge us for like three minutes, I think, yeah. or four minutes. minutes. So watch this, um, and then we're just going to stay right here. When the video is over, Maxie, will you pray a blessing for yeah. us, and this is how we'll end our service today? Perfect. Hi, I'm Michaela, and I live here in Jeffrey's Bay. I am very proud to be a Victory for All child. Let me show you all the different schools and programs. Noah's Ark is our Early Childhood Development Centre. It is a safe and loving place for the youngest of the community to grow and learn. We serve 140 kids from as young as 18 months to 5 years old. Our teachers are all part of the community and know the challenges our children face. They work hard to provide each little one with the individual care and love to grow into healthy and happy children. Welcome to our amazing school. It offers us a bright future. Our school looks like a beautiful castle and it reminds us every day that we are princesses and princess of God. King's College is our very own low-cost independent Christian primary school for grade R to grade 7, located in the heart of the community where our kids are from. We have made high quality education affordable and accessible to children who live in poverty. We also have the most passionate teachers who are dedicated to the success of every child at our school. 
we are constantly growing and developing new and innovative ways to create the best opportunity for each child. There's a lot to see at Rainbow Village. Let's start with the Rainbow Angels. Rainbow Angels is our beautiful equipped centre focused on children with cerebral palsy. There is very little care available for these kids in our area. Every day we provide loving care and therapies for our kids. It is amazing to see their growth and development, which would not have been possible without access to our centre and its dedicated staff. At Rainbow School, kids learn a lot. Come and see. There are so many children with special needs in our area. At Rainbow School, we see the unique potential in every child. We are the only school dedicated to special needs children in our area. Our kids become so much more than what anyone expects. Confident and proud of who they are. Mmm, there's some delicious smells coming from the Skill Centre. Let's go check it out. Rainbow Skill Centre is a place of restoration and hope. Through one-on-one -on -one mentorship and training, young people leaving Rainbow School and other struggling youth from the community acquire skills and start taking care of themselves. We started a small bakery, Sutswan, that makes the best drop waffles in South Africa. They are sold locally and nationally, all made by young people who have come through our program. We hope to provide long-term employment opportunities for more hard-working young people who go through our program by starting more businesses and forming partnerships with other local businesses. You just have to see the beautiful homes of our foster care project. At our Victory for All Homes, we create a loving home for the community's orphaned and vulnerable children. Our dedicated team of foster moms and social workers love and care for these children as if their own. We have eight foster homes with no more than six children in each, providing a safe place where every child can feel like they belong. Hopefully you were able to grab a bit of the heart of Victory for All. All these children you saw and many more, they deserve our support. Please get involved so that more children will receive a way out of poverty and hope for the future. Pray for our children and everyone involved. Donate goods or support us financially. We need you. That video makes me They're smile adorable. every time. I want to go. Um, let's go. <laughs> so here's, how, here's our invitation then. You heard the invitation from Maxi to us. And then the invitation from us to you as well is uh, begin to pray. How is God inviting you to put your hands to the partnership that we feel like God is, uh, is, is brewing here uh, between us and the folks at Victory for All and what's happening in Jeff Jeffrey's Bay? Um, so as we wrap up our service, we know that there are a lot of things that we want to talk to you about, yeah. and there's a lot more life to do together. But will you pray a blessing for us yeah. as our final act today? Perfect. Well, I just want to pray this um, Franciscan blessing that we used to pray all the time at home. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers and half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger and injust injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, injustice, starvation, and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Amen. Maxie, thank you so much for your heart for us today. Uh, friends, I have a, a, a picture of that prayer that Maxie just prayed for us, and so I'm going to make sure that we post that on our social media this week so you can also join us in praying that. Um, as you go, we want to encourage you. Uh, Maxie said, go take a walk. Last week, we we're continuing this. Make some lunch plans. Sign up to uh, join us in our conversations in the future. Grace and peace to you, friends. We'll see you next week.